All right. So welcome, uh, welcome to our third Bible study in the First Corinthians. Uh, again, I do apologize that I missed out last week, uh, but I'm so glad that we can um, just come back and, and have a fresh start to our Bible study. Uh, just a quick recap of what we learned in the past Bible study. We went over the first chapter and, and a little bit into chapter two. Uh, we'll be finishing up chapter two today. And we talked about why Paul was writing to the Corinthians. There was division in the, the church uh, for multiple different reasons. They're quarreling among themselves. There was issues of wisdom, boasting, <laughs> boastingness and puffed upness or just self-confidence and self-glory that people were wanting. Uh, they were judging one another. And the causes of these divisions, uh, we found out there was three root causes. Again, is because they had a misunderstanding of the gospel message. And we're going we're gonna to get a little bit more into this misunderstanding today. They had a misunderstanding when it came to the leaders that came in through the church, whether it's Paul or Apollos or Peter. Uh, they had a misunderstanding of what kind of relationship they had regarding the church. And lastly, uh, they didn't understand the role of leadership or spiritual authority. So that's where we left off. If you guys remember where we left off, Paul, we were at, at, uh, in chapter two, and Paul was talking, using the Corinthians as an example of how God uses weakness. Uh, God uses weakness uh, to shame the strong. God uses foolishness to shame the wise. And he gave the example of the Corinthians themselves. Most of them were not the smartest, richest, most noble birth or any of that. They were pretty common people or maybe even worse than common people. They were maybe former slaves at one point. And God brought, gave them the gospel message and they were come to, able to come to faith. And he was using that example to show them, hey, it's not about being the smartest, being the wisest, all of that, but rather it's about depending on him, turning to the cross, turning to Christ, and focusing solely on that message. And we're going to get a little bit more of that. Uh, so let's just move right into it. Uh, we're going to be finishing up chapter two and, and going into chapter three as well. Uh, or sorry, we didn't start chapter two yet. It was all chapter one last time. Okay, so chapter two, uh, there's going to be a shift in now from moving from the Corinthians as an example. Now Paul's going to use himself as an example. So let me read these verses to you. And I, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. All right, so we're going to stop right there. We're going to dissect just a little bit of this. Uh, Paul is using his own ministry as his own, himself as an example now to give them an understanding of the gospel, the nature of the gospel message, the nature of how God works and where they were falling short in their understanding of this. And he does a little bit of compare and contrast in uh, the first chapter and leading up to the second chapter is he's comparing what they're taking out of this message. Uh, are, they, they, are they siding with the preacher or are they, do they come, um, a walking away from a, a, a message of praising and glorifying the preacher or are they praising and glorifying the savior. Now for the Corinthians, they were upholding the preacher. Remember, you know, they were siding with Paul or Cephas or Apollos. And most of them were siding with Paulos because he had very lofty speech and eloquent words. Uh, but they were missing the whole content of the message that even Apollos was preaching to them. They were so fixated on, man, that guy's a really good preacher. Man, he has really good ways of using words. And that's why they were turning away from Paul, who was actually their founder of the Corinthian church, and moving on to Apollos, and then causing divisions among themselves because they're trying to be loyal to this person or that preacher or that teacher. But they were missing the whole point of the message, the gospel message, which is Christ. And Paul's, again telling them you can't 
yes, it's great to honor the teacher and preacher. But if you walk away from every message just glorifying the preacher, you obviously miss the point. If it doesn't come back to Christ, you are missing the point. And this is something that we are guilty as, as Christians today, too. We go to church and we listen to a sermon and man, man, that pastor, he, he has a wise way to, he, he's so, he has the right words or the right jokes or the right stories or the right application. And, and we miss so much of what the message is about. This is also a warning to preachers. If we're not preaching uh, the message of Christ, uh, if we're not me uh, preaching it so that our uh, hearers are listening and, and walking away with, man, my Savior is amazing, my, I love my Savior, then we are missing out on the reason why we're preaching as well. And that goes into the second thing that he wants us to understand, demonstration versus presentation. For Paul, presenting the gospel message was not a presentation. It wasn't something that he just planned and it's like, man, here's Here's this nice looking thing. It wasn't like an infomercial where he's trying to sell it to them. But rather, Paul saw the gospel message, his ministry as a demonstration because he understood, he experienced the power of God. He experienced the Holy Spirit inside of him that caused him to convert from, uh, remember his past, he was one that persecuted Christians to one now living out and trying to create or lead others to Christ and make more Christians. He was preaching. He was doing life out of demonstration of how God can change someone's heart. Again, we're guilty of this at times uh, when we go to church or we go to church activities or even Bible studies or prayer meetings. Is it more of a presentation of why we're going? Oh, I'm, I'm here to watch the pastor present something to me. Well, I'm here to watch someone teach and present the Bible study to me. But are we, or are we walking and saying, man, I'm going to experience God today. I already know how God has worked in my heart and he's continuing to work. And here I am at church ready to experience more, experience the power of God through a preacher, through the praise, through a Bible study, through prayer. And that's what Paul wanted to teach the Corinthians. Because to the Corinthians, it was all a presentation. To the Corinthians, it was all about, oh, that made me feel good. It wasn't about really experience to a fuller extent of the spirit working in their hearts. Because if they experience the, the demonstration of God's power, they wouldn't be quarreling among themselves. They wouldn't be caught in sin. Rather, they would be turning their lives over. And we'll get into that, why they weren't doing that in a sense. Uh, in the next couple, uh, in chapter three. Again, the weakness of God versus the strength of men. And actually the weakness of God is actually the power of God. But to us, it, uh, it looks like a weakness of God. And uh, again, Paul preached Christ and the cross. And it's not that uh, Paul just stopped at the crucifixion. Uh, he did talk about the resurrection. He did preach Christ in a fuller theological uh, way. Uh, but why he keeps mentioning the cross is because that is embarrassing in the human's eyes to see your savior die on the cross, who was supposed to be the son of God, who, who was supposed to have all this power. Uh, why would, if he has so much power, why could he not save himself? Uh, that's the mindset of, of the human mind. Uh, even today, if you preach or if you talk to non-believers, they're like, why didn't God, if he, if Jesus was God, why didn't he get angels to save him from the cross? And they don't have a fuller understanding of the power of God that had to happen through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. But they only see it from a very literal perspective. Man, if he was God, he should have saved himself. Now, uh, the weakness of God, the way God works is, is just completely different than the way men work, the way we think. Uh, even, uh, again, he shares, he, Paul, his own example, uh, he also shares the Corinthians as an example, but some other examples in the Bible, <coughs> excuse me, uh, some other examples is when Israel wanted a king, they went after Saul, who looked like the part of a king. He was taller than any man. He was more handsome than any man. He, he, 
He just looked a part of a king, but that was not the intended king that God wanted for Israel. And we see how that story unravels. Saul was a terrible king. And rather, there comes from a humble beginning, David, who came, uh, that was the attended king for Israel that God had in mind, but he was just a shepherd boy, the youngest of his family. And he was the one that in any human perspective, if you were to choose a king, David and Saul standing side by side, every man's perspective will be, man, Saul is the one. He has the fit for a king to go into war, but rather the weakness of God, the, the folly of God, the way he uses the humble, the way that he uses the weak to shame the strong, those, the foolish to shame, shame the, the wise, that is what God chose. And there's countless of examples of this. We can think of Moses versus Pharaoh. We can think of even just how Jesus came into this world. And, and we, we were teach, I was teaching this to the youth kids yesterday as uh, we we're talking about Mary and, and the angel and how Jesus is gonna, or I'm gonna teach you next week even more, how Jesus comes into this world is not out of the strength of men. He didn't come coming down in a cloud with all the countries praising him and worshiping him and doing all that. Rather, he came so humbly and seemed so weak. He was in a manger. He was in surrounded by animals and shepherds. And that shows you that it was, it's so funny because that is the weakness of God versus the strength of men. Lastly, Paul wants to explain this wisdom versus revelation. Again, uh, the Corinthians, they have this love for wisdom and it's because of their background, their cultural background. And, and they thought that the gospel message was a wisdom that they gave, was granted to them to make themselves better on, uh, at a higher level than anyone else. They used it as a way to boast and be puffed up because they thought, man, God really loves me. He gave me the gospel message. Not only did he give me the gospel message, but he gave me the gift of like tongues. So I am really loved by God. I am really adored by God because I have the gift of tongues and I have been chosen. And they, they value this so much and they kept it to themselves. But we have to see Paul is trying to explain in these verses Yes, it is the wisdom of God, but the wisdom of God is a revelation to man to understand who God is. It's a revelation that without God intervening and showing us who he is, we will have a, we could not fully under, we wouldn't even come close to understanding God, his redemption plan and his love for us. But it had to be revealed to us because we were so stuck in our sins. And he's going to explain this in the next couple of verses, and he's going to explain how he uses his Holy Spirit to help us in understanding this revelation. Uh, one thing I do want to point out in this past verse, uh, in verse three, Paul says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And scholars are a little bit confused on why Paul is writing like this. Uh, some think it's because it might be re, uh, referring to the thorn in his side, uh, whether, whether if that was a physical or a spiritual or a mental thorn in his side, we don't fully understand. Or some scholars believe it's because Paul, even in himself, thought that his ministry, him coming to preach to people, he was inadequate to come and preach before people because of his past because of what he had done, or he did fear people. Uh, but we see that doesn't stop Paul, whether it was the thorn, whether it was his past, it doesn't stop Paul from going to preach this message, to going to all over a minor Asia and all the way into Europe to preach this message, because it's not about him. It's not about what he has to offer, but he is offering the power of God, the demonstration of the spirit, what he has experienced and the wisdom of God that he wants to give and reveal to others so that they can come to know God. Again, he didn't have the most wisest way of presenting it or the most loftiest ways, but he knew this, he was called to go and that's what he did. He obeyed in faith even though he felt weak, even though he was fearful at times. 
uh, we, we forget, uh, and, and we tend to forget this, even myself, when we read letters of Paul, we always put them on this pedestal. Man, Paul is such a guy of faith. Man, he, he, he is like no one else. And that's true. He was like no one else as a, in, in the sense of his apostleship and his, his fervor for the God. But we have to also remember, Paul was human too. Paul had uh, battles inside of him that he had to overcome as well. And there is much fear and weakness in him, but he overcame it in faith. And that's something I do want to highlight. Moving on, uh, yet, verse six, yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our, for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord, our, the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts, a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Uh, we're going to get into maturity a little bit right after this section as we start chapter 3. But this this section is really talking about the wisdom of God and the revelation that God gave to man through uh, through his Holy Spirit. And, and that's what Paul is trying to highlight. Uh, so that's what we're going to be covering. There's two things I want us to see out of these uh, these verses right here. The first thing is the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age versus our secret and hidden wisdom of God. So again, the wisdom of this age and the secret and hidden wisdom of God. Wisdom of this age is referring to those who have power, authority. They were the trendsetters. They were the ones that people look to for, for wisdom, for understanding, for knowledge. And in that time and age, it, it was the philosophers. Maybe it was the Greek philosophers that came from their past backgrounds or is the government that they look to. Or it, it, is, it is Caesar himself of, of Rome that they look to for wisdom and, and, and the way to live this world. Um, and it's just, uh, that's what they were filling their minds with. Even the Corinthians church, they were filling their minds with the wisdom of this world. Uh, and, and Paul wants to contrast with the secret and hidden wisdom of God. Now, Paul uses this word secret and hidden, and he also uses a different type of word for this in other letters. He always calls it a mystery, the mystery of God. And it was a secret, and it was hidden from us, and it was a mystery for us before Christ came. Uh, but after Christ came, it's no longer a secret, it's no longer hidden, and it's no longer a mystery, but it is a revelation that God gives to us, that he sent his son to die on the cross for us as a way for us and to be raised again. And that was God's redemption plan. That was the secret. That was the hidden wisdom. That was the mystery that now is given to us. And, <clears throat> but again, in, in the understanding of, of the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age, when they were shown this wisdom, this secret, this mystery, they were shown this revelation, they rejected it. The Jewish people rejected it. The Romans rejected it. They, didn't, they couldn't understand and fathom it in their understanding of wisdom because of what they filled themselves up with was the ways of this world. And they could not have faith to believe, even though Jesus showed signs of miracles, even though Jesus taught with such authority and wisdom like no other man, they were blinded and they chose to reject Jesus. Now, this is a warning for the church. This is a warning for us as believers. Uh, today, we are so filled with wisdom of this age. 
We have it at our fingertips on our phones, through social media, through the news, through the internet. Uh, we, we have so much access to wisdom of this age. It's, it's crazy how much access we have because you can go on YouTube and you can find how to do something and follow it right there and then. You don't have to have any previous experience, but you could just follow a YouTube video and just do the little things uh, to, to, to create crazy things or recipes or, or, or crafts and hobbies or whatever, fixing a car, you can find it all. And if we can, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, you can always find hobbies and do that. But that is the thing is, if we continue to let the world influence the way that we see the gospel, it is very dangerous. It's very dangerous for the church to let the ways of this world influence the way they do church, influence the way they present the gospel, influence the way they do ministry. And that was the warning Paul was giving to the Corinthians. Again, they were letting the wisdom of the, whatever ruler or whatever philosopher that they had a background and understanding, and they let that impact the way they saw the gospel. They let that impact the way they saw Christ. This wisdom from God is a revelation. And it says in those verses that, <clears throat> it, again, um, sorry, before I get into that, Paul quotes uh, Isaiah 64, uh, verse 4, and 65, verse 17. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a quote long ago that this is what God even predicted. Uh, what no eye has seen, no ear has, no heart of man imagine. What God has prepared for those who love him. It requires faith to understand this secret, hidden wisdom of God, this mystery of God, this revelation of God. And it requires faith. Because even if you see it, even if you hear it, even if you imagined it, remember their imagination of the Messiah was completely off compared to what the actual Messiah was. It's not what you hear, see, or imagine, but it has to be from faith that you come to know this revelation and it's through the spirit. So second thing, oh, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna start explaining these uh, 10 ver verses 11, but I just wanna read the next couple of verses. We're, it, it, this is a section of the uh, chapter where Paul brings in the spirit and we get to talk about the Trinity. And the Trinity is uh, very confusing. Uh, even for us believers, we don't fully understand it to the fullest extent. How can there be one God in three persons? Uh, and, and, and I've heard even in school, people try to use different examples and illustrations. Um, many of you heard the egg and how there's different parts to the egg, but it's one egg. Or maybe you've heard the example of, you know, I'm a father or like I'm a, I'm a brother to some person in my relationship, but I'm, a, I'm a, 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 a son to another relationship and all these other types of analogies or trying to explain the Trinity, but the Trinity cannot be explained with human wisdom or examples. It just, all of those examples kind of fall apart when we compare it to the Trinity of God. Uh, but this revelation of God's secret and hidden wisdom was revealed to us through the Son, or, or the Son came and he was a revelation, and, but for us is through the Spirit who allows us to understand and have faith in this. So that's what we're gonna explain in the next couple of verses. Uh, let me just read the next couple of verses so that we can have a fuller picture of this of the spirit uh, in the explanation. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the tr things freely given us by God, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has, the, who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? 
but we have the mind of Christ. So what we are reading about is the spirit and, and, and how the spirit is reveals to us this mystery uh, of God's hidden, God's uh, redemption plan for us through Christ Jesus. Again, we don't have the spirit of this world is what Paul's trying to explain to the Corinthians. He knows the Corinthians have accepted Jesus Christ. He knows this without a shadow of doubt, but the way that they're living, that the way that they still stuck in their old, old ways has caught them to see things, not from a, 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 a understanding of this gospel message, but to see it from the ways of this world and the human wisdom that they are trying to gain more of and see the gospel message in that light. Um, but we have to understand the spirit and just those ver these verses and the verses 10 and 11. It was through God's spirit that we are able to understand this gospel message. Now, uh, the Trinity, let me get to my notes really quick. Uh, it's funny because Paul uses Greek philosophy uh, to really drive this point in. In verses 10 and 11, it says, who understands a person but the spirit of the person himself? Uh, humans understand humans is what he's trying to drive in. And that is the, it's a Greek philosophy that he's trying to drive in. Likeness understands likeness. So who understands God the most? It is God himself who understands it. And that's where he brings in the Holy Spirit into the picture and brings into the picture of the Trinity. And we have to understand that who knows God better than God himself, which is the spirit of God. Now, again, they are the same essence. We have, we believe in one God in three persons. They are of the same essence, the God, the Father, God, the Son, the God, the Holy Spirit. But they are three different beings. They have three different roles in, 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 in the Trinitarian process. Uh, God it is from God through the Spirit, and we understand by the Holy Spirit. And it, it is through that it, there is a, a little bit of a submission. The Son submits to the, the Father. And we have to understand this picture, but it's still a little bit confusing. Again, I, I went through the examples of the egg and, and the relationship. We, we don't have a full understanding here on this earth of how it all works. But we do need to understand that all things are from the Father through the Son by the means of the Holy Spirit. So every redemptive act is performed from the Father through the Son by the means of the Holy Spirit. And as we read, so in understanding that, then we can understand how the gospel message works. Um, give me one second, let me go back. Now, for the Corinthians, um, they believed that they were given gifts by the Spirit, and their focus was on spiritual gifts. Their focus was on the, their ability to speak in tongues. And we'll see this in later chapters, that this was what they thought as spiritual. If you don't have the ability to speak in tongues, you're not spiritual. If you don't have the ability to have all these uh, spiritual gifts, uh, then you are not loved by God in a sense. Uh, but we have to understand that is a, not what the gift of God is, but it is the gift of revelation of what Christ did for us. Again, this is something that is freely given to us. That's something that the Corinthians didn't understand. They thought they were, they were, uh, <clears throat> they were the chosen ones that they received it and they were better than everyone else. No, that is not the case. It is freely given. It's not taught by human wisdom, but it comes by the spirit helping us see and understand and know God better. Again, the spirit knows God, but we do not know God without the help of the spirit. Uh, as I study these passages, as I read through commentaries, all the commentary says, if we mount up all the human wisdom in this world, it would not help us know God that much closer at all. It would not help us. 
Uh, we can gather all the human wisdom. We, we can gather all the things of this world to try to understand God, but it will not help us understand God. We need God to help us. And that's why he sends his spirit to us. Now, with his help of his spirit, we do understand God better. We don't understand God fully still. And we had to work on that as we study the scriptures, as we pray to God, as we have a relationship with God, we have this process where we are coming to understand God more and more in our lives. But it's a lifetime that it takes to continue this, this journey. We will never fully understand God in this, in this body, in this form that we are in. But that doesn't stop us from doing what we need to do to understand him. That doesn't stop us from uh, taking on the role and the responsibility to study, to seek him, to pray, uh, to ask the spirit to continue to convict our hearts and, and to really lead us closer into knowing him. Um, <clears throat> so it says the natural person, and this is what they mean, uh, Paul means by the natural person is the person who rejects the gospel message. The person who rejects the gospel message is rejecting the spirit of God, the spirit of God that God gives to us to help us understand, to have faith in his son. But the natural person, the person that are not believers, they reject it. And because they reject it, they cannot understand fully spiritual things. They can't fully understand evil. They cannot fully understand sin and the consequences of sin. Yeah, they see the evil in this world, but they don't come to the understanding that it leads to death, it leads to forever separation from God. They can't comprehend it. But Paul encourages us, if we are believers, we are able to judge these things. We are able to understand it because we have been giving, uh, we have been given, uh, we have the mind of Christ is what Paul is saying is that we through the spirit can understand the, the consequences of sin, the, the, the degree of evil that we can see it and we know what is lying ahead because we have the spirit inside of us to help us understand these spiritual things. So the Trinity, again, Paul has aspects. He brings it all into his letter. It's not just about the Father. It's not just about the Son. It's not just about the Holy Spirit. But we have to understand how they all work, how the process works. Again, this statement, everything is from the Father through the Son by the means of the Holy Spirit. And that plays into our lives. And we cannot lose sight of that. Sometimes at church, we only focus on the Father too much or focus on Christ too much, or, or, or some churches just focus on the Spirit too much. It cannot be just one of the Trinity parts. We have to see the whole Trinity in the picture of how God intended it for redemption plan, for revelation to us. Continuing, but I, brothers, could not confess you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I feed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Paulus, are you not being merely human? So Paul finally comes after explaining the gospel message, how it needs to be centered on Christ, not on human wisdom, how he explains how the Holy Spirit gives us an understanding of God and reveals to us the mystery, the secret and hidden wisdom of God to us and allows us to have faith. He addresses what is going on with the Corinthian people. They believe, but they have not, so they have been justified. They, they went through the process of justification because they accepted Jesus Christ themselves. But the Corinthian people have skipped the process of sanctification and they think they're already at the step of glorification. 
They already think that they are just being poured down with God's love and, and gifts and blessings, and they do not understand this process of sanctification. They do not understand that they need to work on themselves to let go of sins, to let go of judgment, to let go of greed and selfishness. And that's why Paul says, I can't address you as spiritual people yet that you are infants, that you are still people of the flesh. Because when you accepted Christ, you did not understand in full detail what that means. It means to die to the self. It means to die of the old self and put on the new self. And that is something they weren't doing. They were fighting amongst themselves. They were jealous amongst themselves. They were doing sinful deeds uh, whether it was sexual immorality, whether it was anger towards one another, they were still stuck in the fleshly, fleshly understanding, or they were still stuck in the ways of the flesh. So Paul is trying to explain what spiritual maturity is here. Spiritual maturity is this process that we call sanctification, where we grow in our relationship, not only in our understanding of who God is through the help of the spirit by studying the word, but sanctification is the process of us becoming more like Christ, of us becoming whole, more holy, which is to seek holiness, to seek righteousness. And this was something that was not happening in the Corinthian church. They continue to be immature. They continue to be of the flesh. Uh, a, a description is, uh, one way to describe it is the natural person uh, that Paul talked about in the previous verses is a carnal person, one that follows the flesh. And then uh, uh, the, the spiritual person is one that is obedient to God and follows the ways of God. It's crazy to see Paul gave them the ABCs, the one, two, threes of, of how to become a Christian. And they did accept it, but they stopped right there. They thought that was all that it took for their spiritual walk with Christ. And that then they will receive everything, all the good things of God. And again, that's why they point to the gifts. Oh, they have been so blessed with the gift of tongue. But Paul's saying, you guys are so immature. You guys are infants. You, I can't even teach you more because you guys don't have a full understanding of what your life in Christ means. They are still dominated by their flesh. They're still dominated by just their former desires or the way that the world teaches us how to live. And that's actually corrupted their view of Christianity, of, of Christ, of ministry, of church. And that's why they're at this point, at this point in their church where there is division, there is fighting. They need to start the process of sanctification. They need to understand that they need to let go of these former things. They need to go let go of, of, of their strive for wisdom just to be greater than others so they can boast and rather start exchanging it for the, the spiritual things. And he will explain some of those spiritual things as he, in the later on in these chapters, he explains love, what it means to love others. He explains uh, spiritual gifts not in understanding why God gives us spiritual gifts. It's not to be boasting. It's not to be using it so that you can be showing the presentation of it, but it is to use it to further God's kingdom. And they still don't have a grasp of that yet. He goes on to teach them more that uh, again, they thought they were at the step of glorification, so they didn't really care about their moral responsibility. And Paul had to teach them, no, you cannot live in the formal ways of the pagans. You can't fall into sexual immorality. You can't uphold sexual immorality. You can't do any of this. You have to start changing and let God change you, and, and you have to work on yourself you, you let the spirit work and convict you to let go of these things of the flesh and see the things that are more important, the spiritual things that you need, the, the, the desire and relationship that you need to draw closer to God. 
One thing also I forgot to mention in the previous verses, uh, their understanding of a spiritual wisdom is that there is, uh, and regarding the secret wisdom, is that there is the secret knowledge that God gives, and that's how you become accepted into uh, the family. Uh, their understanding of wisdom and the secret knowledge from God is, is something that is more what cult, today's cults try to share to us. They say that, hey, <clears throat> any cult that you refer to, they always say, oh, we have been given the special knowledge, and that is the only way you can know God. And that's something that the Corinthians thought as well. They thought they were the ones given the special wisdom. And again, that's why they boasted in themselves. And that's why they used it to, to elevate themselves over others because they received the special knowledge. But that is not the case when it comes to God's revelation. Again, God's revelation is free, is freely given. It's given to all. It is given to all, but there is rejection of it. It is not the special wisdom that you have to come and learn uh, on the side and go through uh, classes or, 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 or just teachings from these, uh, how, however the cults do it. That's not how you get closer to God. Is This secret wisdom is no longer a secret. This mystery is no longer a mystery. I do have to emphasize that because that's how we see in today's world uh, how other religions, how other cults try to trap us into this, trap other people thinking, hey, there is something something special that I can give to you. It's nothing that we can give. It has to be from God himself. Yes, we are, cho we, we are called to go share it and we are called to go share it freely, but it's nothing that we give. It is God who works on the heart and then God who gives his spirit and, and is through God's spirit and, and the faith and the willingness of a man to come to know Christ. But we are just his vessels. We are his tools to just get that message out. Um, so um, so the, I, I just forgot to mention that in the previous passages. But again, spiritual maturity is something that this Corinthians church is lacking. They need to grow in. And this is what Paul needs to address more and more. Uh, and, and he even ends with a silly thing that they're fighting about. Why are you continuing to fight about, are you for Paul? Are you for Apollos? He's saying, we are nothing. We are just humans. We are just vessels of the servants of God. Why are you guys siding with humans when you should be more focusedly focused on God himself? Why are you focusing on just mere humans when you should be focused on the message, the ministry of Christ itself? So I think uh, as we, he will further explain spiritual maturity, but he gives us a taste and he also gives us this understanding that genuine believers can still and behave and act like unsaved people. Genuine believers who have accepted, they have been justified by Christ, they can get stuck at this stage of still being carnal, still being fleshly, still living by their fleshly desires. And that's why they are still infants. That's why they are still what Paul calls not spiritual people, but people of the flesh. But that's where the church comes in to help that's where us as brothers and sisters, we come in, that we need to work together to help each other not only be stuck in our fleshly desires, but help each other grow in our understanding of Christ, grow in our understanding that the desires of this world is not what this, what this life is all about. That the desires that this world imposes on us or and, and tries to focus us on is not what it's about. But as believers, we have to let that go. And there are times where it's hard for us as believers, but that's why we are not doing it alone. That's why there is such an importance of a body of believers. That's why God gave us the church. 
It's because we are to do it together, to help one another out, to sharpen one another, to rebuke one another, to, to, to teach one another, to forgive one another. It, it all intertwines. In this letter for Paul, he is rebuking them in a sense, but he's also doing it, his rebuke out of love. He wants them to understand and see where they're stuck in in their walks with Christ. They're still stuck at that begin, literally the beginning of letting go of their past life to exchange it for something greater, the new life, to put on the new self, as Paul writes in his other letter. Um, so that's today's Bible study. Uh, I'm sorry. I did talk fast. I know we cover a lot of verses. I didn't want to go too slow at, uh, each verse at a time. Uh, but if you have any questions or if you have any comments that you, or if there's any, uh, verse that was confusing you, I will open up the floor at this time to allow, uh, for questions or sharing or even insight that you would like to share.